Ah. Ah. Okay. Does everyone see that? All right. So, as I said before, I'm Lord Bartholomew Sharp. I'm going to be giving you sort of a rough overview of Tudor fashion from the middle part of the Tudor reign, so 1530 to 1540. of some of the trends in fashion, what were common items of clothing, as well as the difference between upper and lower classes at the time. So um, basically the period that we're covering actually has the majority of the Tudor monarchs, um, except for the original Tudor monarch, which is Henry VII. But this particular, the middle period, I find it actually shows some of the bigger transitions between the clothing, like it's a wider range of stylistic changes. So I think this is a very interesting period in the Tudor timeline. Uh, also, my primary persona is based in fifth, drowns in 1545 on the Mary Rose. So this is really one of my main areas of interest. So. When people tend to think of the Tudors, they really have these two images sort of in their minds, I find. You either have Henry VIII, you know, in all of his masculine glory, or you have Elizabeth I, um, which is a little outside of the time period that we're looking at that particular portrait. But those are sort of the main things that people tend to think of in Tudor fashion. Sort of the two extremes of the masculine and the feminine, if you, you know, want to look at it that way. But there's a lot of variation that sort of runs through the whole time period. And I want to try and show you a little bit of that. Sort of, these are the basic layers of clothing that if you're going to go out in public, you would have had some equivalent thereof. For uh, women, you would essentially start with your shift chemise. You would then have either a kirtle, which would cut, uh, excuse me, kirtle or possibly a body and, and skirt and some form of head covering. Male clothing generally consisted of a shirt, a doublet, hose, and again, some form of hat head covering. Additional layers that were then added onto those, which are actually in many respects the much more interesting layers of clothing, because that's where you tend to see a lot of the decoration and the variations, particularly as you go through the period. You see things like gowns, uh, various forms of sleeves, which may or may not be detachable uh, or in multiple parts on the sleeves, uh, particularly in women's fashion. You have things like the farthingale, the bum roll. I forgot to type in uh, bodies or corsets, which begin in this period which are undergarments that actually help shape the entire sort of profile of what women are wearing. With men, you have uh, things like the jerkin, which there's no real hard or fast rule for it. We tend to think of it as a sleeveless garment. Back then, they weren't quite so set with that. So it could be with or without sleeves. You also had things like gowns or coats, which again, just additional layers that would have been worn to deal with the elements as well as show off your status in life. So, what were the clothes made of? They were made of, you know, this is probably not news to anybody here, but linen, wool, silks, and mixed fabrics. It all depended on where your social status was and what you were using. Linen, which these are some of the other, basically the types of weaves I've added, some of the period terms that were used for those, the various grades or weaves of linen here, as well as the wools and silks. Linen tended to be used as for shirt shifts, undergarments, things of that nature, as well as linings. A little bit of they also are used for men's doublets pretty routinely. 
wool is sort of the mainstay of the outerwear. You see it primarily, you know, it's skirts, it's petticoats, it's doublets, uh, it's hose of various type, either what we'd call stockings now or short hose, um, which I'll touch, touch on a little bit later. You wool came in an unbelievable variety of weaves and styles. And again, it really boiled down to where you were in the social ladder as to what you got to use, what you could afford and what was available. Um, I just thought this was kind of a fun picture of a variety of Tudor textiles there, um, which was actually part of a ANS project uh, during the pandemic. <laughs> so silks, I, unless you're fairly well up the, uh, the pecking order, you're not going to be using silks for the most part, unless you have very small levels amounts of it for, say, decoration or facing. And then you also have mixed fabrics, which the, the two examples that I've got there are pretty big difference. Fustian, which is a mixture of either linen or actually cotton or linen and wool. Um, it was a generally a 12 weave and actually woven so that you basically had sort of a fuzzy nape on it, a lot like uh, cotton cotton moleskin today, or even the low pile cotton velveteens are actually not that dissimilar from what I've read to sort of the feel that came in a lot of different very um, uh, qualities, the best normally coming from places like Milan uh, in Italy or in Genoa. You also have things like cloth of silver or cloth of gold, which are restricted to the absolute top of the food chain. Those are royal, you know, this is silk. It's essentially, it's a damask-like weave where you have silk and you have actual gold or silver threads. <laughs> so that's the very top of the pile. Moving right along, I'm going to start out here in the 1530s uh, in this particular slide, which is actually one of my favorite paintings and could be a class unto itself if you want to talk about symbolism. This is The Ambassadors by Hans Holbein, but I think this actually gives a really excellent example because you can see the uh, gentleman with the globe behind him who is French ambassador. I don't remember his name off the top of my head. But you can actually see all the various layers of his clothing here, what I've already mentioned. You can see the pink slash doublet that he's wearing. You can see a black jerkin, which is the v-necked and then skirted garment, uh, which has a belt over it there. You can see below that just, unfortunately, this isn't a very good copy of the picture, but if you, in a better quality one, you can see just a little bit of fringe of where he's actually wearing a pair of short hose and then has uh, tights or stockings or referred to as nether hose below that. Over the top of this, he has a coat or gown which has the giant puffed sleeves, which were very much a fashion of the 1530s in the Tudor court. Henry VIII is very much synonymous with that sort of very broad shouldered, very, you know, masculine sort of uh, profile. The gentleman on the other side there, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on which side is left or right for you all because it's reversed for me. He was actually a, a bishop, I believe. And he's very wearing a very interesting gown, which is actually some sort of silk damask and it's trimmed with fur. So again, he may be a man of the clergy, but he's definitely showing you where he runs in the social ladder by what kind of a cloth is being utilized here. So also you can see two very good examples of the kind of headwear that were common. Uh, you have a black cap, and then you have a hat that's essentially got two different, it's made of multiple parts, but it's sort of somewhere between a flat cap and not, I guess. <laughs> I don't really know what to call it. But. 
These are a couple more from the 1530s, and these are a little bit lower down the food chain. Uh, but they're still relatively wealthy individuals. Again, you can see with this gentleman over here, both of these paintings are by Hans Holbein, by the way. You can actually see how there doesn't appear to be any sort of closure on the front of his doublet and or jerkin there. What you see in most of the art is a lack of buttons, whether they're closed with hook or eye or lace, either are possible. The buttons seem to start coming in a little bit later as sort of the standardized closure on, on uh, men's doublets. But this gentleman here is actually displaying the very uh, squared off low neck which a lot of times we actually associate with Germanic fashion. Um, it was very common in England, actually most of Western Europe at the time. But this is just a really good image again of showing those various layers along with that low. And you can also see all of the uh, gathering right here on the neckband of his linen shirt. Doo -doo. Here we actually have the two Excuse me. Two queens of England. You have Anne Boleyn, and you have her <laughs> uh, Jane Seymour, who follows her. Or yes, Jane Seymour. Um, these show the sort of uh, gowns that are being worn. You can actually see the little stitches and/or pins here, which are actually holding the gown closed. Because multiple types of sleeve. These may well have been separate here. Very low neck in this period. And you also have these two different bits of headwear, which are quite interesting. Anne Boleyn, a lot of, a lot of time you will read that she actually popularized the wearing of the French hood in England, whether or not that's true or not. Yeah. But you have these two styles. You have more of a gable hood here on the left or on the right, I'm not sure, sorry. French hood over here. This is another one. This is actually showing a nice over gown here with beautiful sleeves over the top of it. Uh, this is another one by Holbein. I believe it was dated to 1537. I don't remember, I'd have to check my notes. Somewhere right in there but you can really see the sort of majesty of that overgown there, so. Not backwards, thank you. Moving into the 1540s here, we have two images, one of the young King Edward the V, Sixth, thank you. Sick, thank you. You can see here where the profile is beginning to change a little bit, and you're no longer getting quite as wide of the shoulder in men's fashion. You're also seeing you're seeing a trend where it's beginning to come a little bit slimmer, um, and this will actually get progressively so as you go later into the period where the uh, shoulders become less and less prominent in men's wear and actually you kind of get an inverse where you start getting much wider pants instead of shoulders but you can also see here where there's actually buttons now being utilized here as a main closure on the front of his jerkin i just really like this painting so <laughs> that's why i added it he also has a very interesting collar there Spanish fashion. Yeah. While I'm mostly focusing here on the clothing of the aristocracy because that's actually the easiest thing to find sources of, this is one of the paintings that actually shows a little bit lower down the food chain. This is the Field of the Cloth of Gold, which was painted in 1545, even though it represents events that happened actually, what? 20 years earlier, somewhere in there. 
so the fashion is actually of the 1540s, even if it is actually representing something that has happened in the past. Um, unfortunately, I can't get to zoom in here, but you actually get a good look at some of the more, you know, more regular people's clothing down here, which is, you know, it may be following the trends of the upper aristocracy, but it's a little more subdued. It's not quite as fancy, you know. It's you dressed as well as your station would allow. Uh, this is the second painting in that series. Actually, this is the embarkation at Dover. I don't remember which one of these is. I want to just believe it's supposed to be Mary Rose. But again, this actually depicts soldiers here. So this actually shows a little bit more of the social spectrum. And if you zoom in, you can again see they have the same amount of layers. It's just nowhere near as fancy. You also down here, which I wish I could zoom in on this. You can clearly see how very few, if any of these folks are still wearing joined hose, like in the medieval period, and it's pretty much all become separate at this point. Moving right along. The fashion doesn't seem to move quite as much, at least from my understanding. Um, these images I actually really like because they show the shape created with a farthingale. It has this lovely, you know, almost conal shape. The farthingale is essentially an underskirt which actually has rigid hoops in it, and it helps provide that nice shape to the skirts and over skirts there. I just wanted to throw in a little bit here that shows a little bit of how fashion is actually changing in mainland Europe in 15, you know, in the 1540s. This is a gorgeous painting of Catherine uh, Eleanor de Toledo, uh, which shows again sort of the Italian style. This is one from the Netherlands. One of the reasons I wanted to show this is a variety in head covering as well as the partlet, which was an additional garment, which women did wear, provides a little bit of extra warmth, modesty. Um, so moving right along. Uh, we're into the 1550s now. This is Mary I of England and her husband, Philip II of Spain. You know, I don't find that it's quite as recognizable the differences that are the changes, at least in English women's fashion at the time, so much as it is with menswear. To be fair, I've also studied menswear considerably more. But by this period, you're really beginning to see more of what we think of many people's might as the Elizabethan sort of image by the 1550s. Of course, by the end of it, it is the Elizabethan age, but you can clearly see here much sl smaller profile um, and the cut piece, of course, still there, will be for another 20 odd years, but generally a much slimmer profile for men at this time. And again, I've been talking mostly about high class here. We don't have a whole lot of images. In fact, we have very few images of English lower or middle classes. There's really kind of a lack of that art. This, this is one of uh, Bruegel's paintings uh, called, generally called The Peasant's Wedding. He did a lot of these based on sketches that he actually did earlier in his life. This was painted around 1560 maybe even 1565, probably depicts people wearing clothing that is actually from an earlier time period. So this gives us a, a good idea of what common people were probably wearing. So these are just a couple books that um, I think if people are really interested in this subject, give you a very good overview as well as construction details if you're interested in making any of the clothing, but also ones that cover 
sort of the really in-depth cost of clothing, things like that, the difference in social status, um, the symbolism that you see in paintings. So I will actually put that one in the chat here in a little bit. But that was actually most of the bulk of the presentation. So I wanted to spend the rest of the time with any questions or discussions that anyone could have. So. Anybody? There should um, be you can raise your, you can sorry, raise you... your hand. So I think a couple of us did that. And I just realized since you weren't familiar, you might not have noticed. Um, so people are raising their hands so you could call on them if you wanted. Um, I just wanted to start with like, the, um, you know, what colors were common, especially in, with specific dyes. Um, like especially on different levels, like what would the um, lower classes use in terms of colors? So they actually had quite a few colors open to them. Um, while it does seem that a lot of the research shows that you have natural colored walls being used primarily or natural colored canvases, they had access to a wide range of dyes. I forgot to put some slides in here, but woad well so blues yellows greens reds and a huge variation within all those um you also had dyes that were pretty much thought of solely as country folk things like buckthorn where you can get blue green red pinks yellowish from one plant so there's a pretty wide variation in what they had access to that's actually one of the reasons that i showed the uh, bruegel painting because it kind of gives you an idea of the color spectrum that could be utilized by lower class people. Good. Good. Um, you have a question in the uh, chat. Have you by from Yvette? Have you done any research on into clothing sumptuary laws? I have done some. Um, in fact, that was actually where a lot of the information pertaining to fabrics and where they fall in their social status, things like the cloth of silver and gold being restricted. The sumptuary laws are basically keep getting redefined and redefined up until, well, basically the Jacobean age. By that point, they've the kind of the cats out of the bag by the time of James the first. But even Elizabeth is still enacting sumptuary laws well into her reign. So, but it does, it basically said, if you're worth X amount of money, this is what you get to wear. If you're below X amount of money, this is what you get to wear. And essentially that was what it dictated. So, I mean, there's quite a few stuff that are restricted to only the very top of the nobility, essentially, you know, with things like furs and silks and various other ones are restricted to the very top of the social spectrum. Um, and then you have very cheap cloth that can be pretty much the only people who are gonna be wearing it are the peasants, so. And yes, Elizabeth banned woad production within 15 miles. If you've never worked with woad, it is disgusting. It, it smells unbelievably. Yeah. Uh, Devin? Devin? Yeah, so um, this may be basic, but it's one that drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between a doublet and a jerkin? How, where's the dividing line there? <laughs> so that dividing line really seems to be a modern thing. You will, in, in general, it seems to be that a jerkin was worn over the top of a doublet. When you get into some of the written records, they're not quite as strict with it as we as modern historians would want to be. Generally though, if you're reading any kind of modern publication, if they're referring to a jerkin, it's generally a sleeveless garment worn over the top of your doublet is what most modern authors are generally referring to. Might have a long skirt, it might have shoulder wings, it might have puffy, you know, 
there's a wide variation in it. Could be leather, could be cloth. No, there's, you know, if you want to see, there's some fantastic preserved ones uh, from this time period. They're actually leather ones as well as a wool one that was recovered from the warship of the Mary Rose. So that's right, 1545. So right in the midst of this, uh, what we're discussing today. Yeah. Um, and so is there any difference in how they close or not? Um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, different question. You were just talking about how hard it is to find working class um, examples of clothing. Would you mind dropping some resources where we could oh, find the... that? Artwork is kind of hard. So I hate to say it. Um, because they might revoke my citizenship, but in many respects, England was a backwater as far as art and culture went in the earlier part of the 16th century. You just have a very, you have a lack, unlike somewhere like the Netherlands that has the genre paintings that show common people. Um, there are things like the Museum of London actually has an excellent online resource database that show, that does have a lot of things like shoes and various other items that have been recovered from the Thames. The book series called Before the Mast. Um, again, unfortunately, this is focused more towards men's clothing and, and military side of things. But Before the Mast cover, it details the personal effects, clothing, everything else of the, uh, that were found on the the warship Mary Rose, which are just fantastic. So yeah, that is uh, a lovely book and they've got it back out in print and it's easily available these days too. A little pricey, but worth, worth it. Awesome. Um, yeah, I can actually, uh, let me see if I can read, come up with some more references for you, but I'll, I'll think about it. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I was just going to add towards the color question, mm -hmm. even though the dye range was very wide, it seems as though people made really conservative choices in England and wore very few colors. Um, uh, in their forthcoming book about uh, typical Tudor, um, Jane Malcolm Davies and Ninia Michaela have been doing research on wills. And they have read and databased hundreds of wills from this, this period, sort of the 16th century, but mostly from the 1530s to the 1590s. Um, and the vast majority of underclothes are either undyed or red, and yeah. the vast majority of overclothes are black. Um, I have a pie chart, actually I have a photograph of a pie chart they showed. I, di I didn't want to add any of those for fear of copyright issues. <laughs> right, right, because they haven't published it yet. Published and it I don't, yet, yeah. And I don't want to mess with that. Exactly. Um, but theoretically, theoretically by October, that book will be mm -hmm. out and you can buy it and look at them yourself. Yeah. But that's um, sort of the summation. The, actually there, if you really are interested in looking into some of the wills and probates, you can actually look up a lot of it on the Elizabethan costuming page. They have a portion of that website has a lot of um, books of receipts, inventories, things like that, that you can actually read directly what people had. Um, um, can you post the link to that? Yeah, let me see if I can. Give the other thing that's on there is Melanie Schusler Bond um, went through the Lyle letters, which is a yep. correspondence done between um, uh, the uh, gentleman who uh, the the gentleman who um, was in charge of the port at Calais and um, his 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 wife. And um, Melanie pulled out all of the mentions of clothing in that. Mm -hmm. So there's a database of that. Hang on, I'm gonna. Uh, yeah. There you go. 
uh, the writers are it's it's going to be sold under the the Tudor Taylor. I just put it there. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I have a question. What are you making for your elevation? Since one of the reasons that I asked you to do this was so that we could make clothes to go to your ele elevation. Yes, um, I am making, I have the hose done, which are black wool slashed with olive silk underneath it. I have a wool and silk blend doublet, mostly finished with my only trip to Penzix silk I purchased underneath that slash so <laughs> and then there will be either a wool and or velvet jerkin over the top of that haven't decided if I'm making myself shoes yet uh, do you want to talk about where you buy buy fabric so <laughs> anywhere and anywhere and everywhere. Uh, primarily, I actually source from Burnley and Trowbridge, who are folks down in the Williamsburg area, Virginia. They really do a very good job of collecting, you know, fabrics that look the part for historical clothing. Their primary focus is 18th century, but a lot of it actually does work for the earlier time periods. So. Um, but I want to add that um, once you've educated your eye about what good, you know, basic weave wools look like, mm -hmm. you can buy them any place. Oh, yeah. It's just a matter of like learning what what they look like and what they feel like to make sure that they're you're not getting something with a little synthetic in it. And one of the classes that I hope to run not on Zoom because it just doesn't work is actually one solely on finding fabrics that sort of match up with the descriptions or the surviving stuff that we have, you know, to give people an idea of what to look for when they're out shopping. So that's one I've wanted to run for a while. And then there was a pandemic. So um, it's still pretty easy, even in, you know, just New York City uh, to find good basic black wool. It's not cheap, but it's easy. Now, what I, what I do find, and actually I did a really cool experiment last year where I created a sort of a lower class black wool fabric using um, dyeing it with a mixture of indigo and black walnuts. And it produced a really beautiful, if you looked at it in bright sunlight, you'd see it was actually a super dark brown, but it's probably a pretty good representation of a lot of the sort of, you know, slightly lower class black colors that would be seen in garments. It was really kind of a fun, fun experiment. Basically, it stemmed from I messed up dyeing it with the indigo and said, well, I'm just going to chuck it in with the walnuts now and see what happens, but it came out really cool. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Mm -hmm. Tell us about how you roll your hems. That's what I want to know. <laughs> that, Nobody's that going to ask, then I'm going to ask my questions. This man rolls a beautiful hem. <laughs> that one's definitely a uh, an in-person uh, teaching opportunity, I think. So, and I think it was making all of the you know the uh, hundreds of inches of uh, roughs for my 17th century stuff. But They're beautifully done. Thank you. Uh, how do I set my dies? Dies are actually, for the most part, they're either set beforehand with a mordant. So you primarily I use alum, which is a salt, which allows the die to adhere and basically keeps it on the fabric. But not all dies require it. Um, most of the ones that are actually tannic acid, uh, like things like walnuts or buckthorn bark actually adhere without it. In the long run, all natural dyes eventually fade <laughs> to an extent. 
Um, some of them are more color and wash fast than others, but and yes, if you can afford to get the stuff from the historical fabric store in Sweden, I recommend it uh, wholeheartedly. It is beautiful stuff. Um, I believe that there are a number of different places that are selling um, re selling good wools as well. Um, uh, I want to say oh. District 96, who sell at Penzik. Yeah. Um, and I think Sartor has even begun to sell some wool. They do. Um, Again, not cheap. A, no, and actually the one that I worked with earlier this year was, um, I'm going to mess up the name. Give me just a second here to pull them up. company out of Germany and I just cannot find the yeah uh, not remember how to spell it it's toss and stuff something along those lines but they make a really nice selection of actually modeled walls which really reproduce period stuff very well so um you could always put links to your favorite suppliers in the uh, chat of the facebook um event okay i will and do that i'll publish get, put that yeah on that would here. get to everybody yep but thank you everybody if there's nothing else i don't no more questions come on people I've got one real quick <laughs> go okay. What's your favorite historical codpiece style? <laughs> Good choice. I mean, if, if you're going to do it, you may as well do it with Henry VIII style because, you know, it's so absurd, you know. Okay, which of Henry VIII's codpieces? All right. I'm going to mute you. You're troublemaking. <laughs> Anyone else? Anything else? Uh, if not, then I want to thank you for coming. And um, I hope we'll see you again soon. Uh, we, uh, You should all come see Axel's, uh, excuse me, Bartholomew's uh, elevation at, um, at Barleycorn in September. So. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This wasn't as painful as I thought it would be. As I said, it's my first time trying to do this on Zoom. So, well, thank you for being willing to do it. So, thank you. Thank you for, pro for prodding me to do it. So, thank you. I have plenty of evil in my. Anyway, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye.